Greetings from Tokyo. This is Daisuke Beppu, and I hope all of you are doing very well today. I just wanted to touch base with you and just let you know that I have been receiving a bunch of really fantastic comments from a lot of people, and I've been doing my best to keep up because a lot of you have、oh, just so many. Exciting and uh, uh, just illuminating comments, so, so filled with vitality and life. I'm just so grateful. Every day I'm so grateful that I, I started this YouTube channel and I'm able to read these comments from you because it's just, for me, it's just a total blessing. So thank you very much.、Um, I, I do want to say that. A lot of people have been so kind to ask me about a lot of things,、um, and unfortunately, I'm not so intellectually well equipped to answer every question that's posed to me. So, I'm a little bit embarrassed、uh, a lot of the time when I'm trying to respond to some of these comments because these comments are all so brilliant, and I'm just so. <laughs> Unable to answer.、Uh, it's really wonderful learning experience. But a number of you actually have asked me about my own、uh, background and where I come from and how I grew to love film the way I do. And I suppose, yes, I, I received comments from people like、uh, Luke at Razor Wire Reviews. And also, I received a great question from、uh, Retro Player 72. So, if you don't mind, maybe I'd like to take this opportunity to just share with you just a few details about my own background and how I became the person that I am, at least in the context of watching film. So, I was born in 1979. So, by my count, that makes me 39 years of age as of the making of this video. So,、um, I do have, I'm married and I have two kids.、Uh, one is six and one is about to turn two. And so, and I live in Tokyo. I live and work in Tokyo. So, that's just in a nutshell who I am. But I did live for a little bit in the United States, and I also lived for a little bit in the United Kingdom when I was a child. So, my upbringing, my childhood, was spent for the most part、uh, outside of Japan. And this was due primarily to my father's job. My father's company would transfer him to, for example, the New York office or then to the London office. And so we would all, my mother, my father, and, and I, we would go to, we would live in、uh, the United States in Connecticut. And then we would also live in London, or near London, I should say, in Surrey. We first lived in Guildford, and then we lived in Woking. And then we also moved back to Connecticut, and I ended up going to college in Connecticut. And then after graduation, I,、um, I decided to try my hand in Japan. And、uh, after a few,、uh, a few years,、uh, I ended up, yes,、uh, living and working and being married and having kids in Tokyo. So that's it. That's it. But along the way, of course, I did grow to love film very much. And I owe that in large part to my parents. Now, I'm an only child, and my parents, well, my parents now, unfortunately, both of them are now、uh, not with us. They're both dead. So they died re rather recently, in fact. So it was a bit.、Um, uh, it, They died too young, in my opinion. But I have very fond memories of them. And 
the fondest memories of those fond memories are those that involve film and cinema and I suppose yes the reason why I say that is because they were always very encouraging and they always let me watch you know, within reason of course they let me watch many sorts of films and they allowed me for example to watch horror films when I was very young and so I was able to watch films like Nightmare on Elm Street and uh, Friday the 13th and Halloween and the sequels um, I remember being so scared when I f when we rented Halloween 2 I remember Halloween 2 in particular that was such a thrill because I, re I remember it being so much fun to be scared by that film and I would just hide and, and go like this and, and close my eyes and it was just a great time and then yeah this was a great time it was a great time living in England because I remember I was able to watch on TV do you remember LWT London Weekend Television they would often show the James Bond films on TV uh, with certain regularity and I remember in particular watching the television commercial promo for like next week's James Bond film and it was Moonraker and I remember they showed the clip of the pre-title sequence where Bond is pushed out of the airplane without a parachute and I remember just looking at that and just thinking to myself that is the coolest like that's the coolest sequence I've ever seen in my life and Jaws is there oh my goodness that was a great that was a great time watching James Bond films on London Weekend Television, and and so I would record, I would take videotapes, and I would record all the films that I could. I would always try to get as many as I could, and of the ones that I was able to record, I would always watch them over and over again, and that was where I I developed my love for James Bond films, and that is how I grew to love James Bond films, such that now. My favorite James Bond film is, of course, of course, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, of course. Although, I must admit, lately, The Man with the Golden Gun is, is slowly creeping up my favorites list. Uh, I used to not like that film at all, but now I'm, I'm growing quite fond of it, actually. But now, incidentally, my favorites are On Her Majesty's Secret Service and From Russia with Love. And even now, um, it, it's after the fact, but uh, Casino Royale, the Daniel Craig film, I think is really good. But anyway, anyway, so this was my uh, education into the cinematic world of James Bond. And yes, so my parents were very encouraging, and they would let me watch... Uh, within reason, of course, uh, s the films that I wanted to watch. They drew a line with respect to uh, films of a, a sexually explicit nature, so I wasn't able to watch films that they knew had, where it was very, had a lot of intense sex scenes or um, anything of that sort. Not necessarily, you know, of a pornographic level, but maybe films that had a lot of nudity or a lot of sex uh, that they knew of, I wasn't able to watch. Of course, there would always be the occasional film that would just slip by them and so I would just watch a film and suddenly be confronted with a lot of naked bodies but for the most part uh, it, you know the my parents were very open and uh, so with that uh, they would also buy cheap VHS tapes for me at the nearby WH Smith's in Guildford and so this is where I got exposure to all these great films of Alfred Hitchcock so they got Rebecca and Notorious and Spellbound and so I'd watch these films over and over and over again I remember the, the, also Gone with the Wind the, 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 just watch over and over again uh, Planet of the Apes I just remember watching that film just yeah and also the Star Wars films on, on VHS tape with the CBS Fox, do you remember that logo? It changed color, um, or no? It didn't change color, did it? It had that, it had that nice music at the beginning. You know, da 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 da. Do you remember that? 
So those were videotapes that we got when I was still living in the United States at the time. So I remember those with, with great fondness. So the, the old VHS tapes of, of the, the original Star Wars trilogy. And also Alien and Aliens too, I must add. And Batman, uh, the Tim Burton Batman. Yeah. And also, yes, yes, uh, Big Trouble in Little China. So this is where I, I got the VHS tape of Big Trouble in Little China. And I think my life changed. <laughs> I think my life changed when I, uh, my parents got me the VHS tape of Big Trouble in Little China. Yes. I think, yes, I would say that that was probably the first important film that I saw that had a profound effect on me. Uh, I can't quite explain it except I feel just so I feel so at home with that film I don't think I'm I could ever tire uh, watching that film Big Trouble in Little China I think I made a video uh, about my thoughts about Big Trouble in Little China so if you're interested please take a look at that video uh, I kind of spoil it so I wouldn't recommend watching it unless you've seen the film already but um, yeah, Big Trouble in Little China. That was a, a really formative film in my in my cinema uh, viewing uh, childhood. <laughs> Gosh, that was a great film. And so yes, yeah, so as I grew older um, and uh, you know got into high school, that was when I started to watch uh, maybe more quote unquote art house films or highbrow films. I don't like those phrases, but just for lack of a better expression. And I remember the first time I saw Yojimbo, the film by Akira Kurosawa. And that was the next film that was quite formative. It, it, was, a, it was like a, a great, um, I, I finished the film and it was like uh, light was seeping into my brain. It was as though I was exposed to something that was truly miraculous. And uh, my and I think by that point I, there was no turning back. I just tr devoured all the films that I could for, by Kurosawa, and then also uh, I discovered Bergman. And you know this is the the normal route, right? You go Kurosawa, Bergman, and then Fellini, and then maybe Antonioni. And for the most part, I remember I didn't like the films very much when I saw them. I did love Yojimbo, but for example, I didn't like Eight and a Half when I saw it as a high school student. I didn't like La Ventura when I saw it as a high school student. Uh, I didn't like um, Seventh Seal when I first saw it as a high school student. I thought it was quite boring, actually. And so it's just amazing, isn't it, how the uh, advent of age and time can help one to reevaluate and appreciate great cinema like The Seventh Seal and Eight and a Half. And um, uh, yeah, just it, it's amazing. It's so amazing. So I, I love them. So I can't believe that I didn't like them when I was like, well, actually, I, I, I take that back because I think those films tend to have subject matter that, at least from my point of view, I could only be able to appreciate with a little bit of years under my belt. And maybe the experience of being married and having kids really helped me to uh, appreciate some of these films that I couldn't ap have appreciated when I was in high school. But I did try to watch as many as possible of these films, you know, the Janus. And so from here, this is how I learned of the Janus Films logo and the greatness of that logo. And then when I was uh, in, in university, or I think it was maybe just before I entered university, perhaps, this was around that time that the film Vertigo was restored. Now, do you remember that? So the restoration, this is a pretty big deal at the time. And before that restoration, of course, I had seen the film on that lovely blue boxed VHS tape with Jimmy Stewart hanging, right? Do you remember that? Uh, but I didn't truly fall in love with the film until I saw that restoration in the theater. And when I did, I was... I was just swept away and I, I didn't like the stereo you know there's a bit some when the stereo is a bit too all-encompassing you know when the gunshots are fired it just suddenly echoes throughout the 
the the whole theater and I don't think it should be like that I think vertigo should should be um, um, uh, like you know it's like listening to the Beatles you know it's better to listen to the Beatles the mono box you know, I think the same with vertigo I think it's better to listen to vertigo in mono rather than in stereo but that's just my own personal take but anyway anyway despite that minor misgiving I truly fell in love with the restoration of Vertigo and I just remember seeing that film so many times when it was in the theater and it was a truly magnificent experience such that now Vertigo is my favorite film ever. My favorite film ever is Vertigo and I watch that film. I have the Blu-ray of it and I watch it uh, once a month. It's, I just I can never tire of that film. And it was around the time when I was in high school, just about to enter college, that I, I saw that film and truly began to appreciate it. And so now I just, I love that film. I think I can recall certain scenes and dialogue verbatim. Uh, I, I just love that film so much. I don't know how many times I've seen that film now. It must be just so many times. But And... I've never been to San Francisco. Can you believe it? So, you know, one of the things I want to do before I die, uh, before I, sh you know, uh, uh, what's the phrase, shuffle off this mortal coil, is to visit San Francisco and to visit the sites of Vertigo as they were depicted in the film, or visit the San Francisco sites as they were depicted in the film Vertigo. I'd love to do that one of these days. Um, so yes, so that was another seminal moment of my film loving experience is watching Vertigo. And then around this time when I was in college, that was when I truly discovered the works of David Lynch. And um, yes, I was, I was a bit too young to appreciate Twin Peaks when it was first broadcast on TV, but I caught up with it later. I remember I bought a huge uh, VHS set of Twin Peaks. Do you remember that? And I just watched that over and over again. I just love that so much. Um, I Unfortunately, that set didn't have the pilot, so I had to buy the pilot tape separately. And it wasn't the TV pilot. It was the international version. So it was the, the version that wasn't the TV pilot, but it was the one that was edited for show overseas or in outside of the North American market. So it, would, it was... Almost as though it was, it was, it was an, is, it was its own little movie, so it wasn't a true pilot, but still, I, I got the gist of it, and so that was a really wonderful uh, moment discovering David Lynch uh, in high school and in college. Uh, that was a great time, and then by the time I graduated, that was when the uh, film Mulholland Drive came out. So that was a really wonderful bit of timing, I must say, and you know. I mean, when I was in college, too, I would just go to the theater and watch movies over and over again that I was really, admi I'd really admired at the time. For example, I did that with films like Magnolia, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia, which I still love uh, to this day. I know it's a little bit um, not as well regarded amongst his films, and I understand that. But for me personally, there is a, a real sense of nostalgia and uh, fondness I feel for that film because I was so fond of it when it was first released. Um, also, I remember seeing the uh, Hirokazu uh, Koreeda film, Afterlife. Do you remember that film? And I saw that film so many times in the theater. I don't know why I was just so captivated by that film. And I remember thinking, this filmmaker is... is Great, and by that time he had only made um, a Maburoshi and his afterlife, so I didn't realize that he would be the great filmmaker that he is today. But man, that was a wonderful film. That still is a wonderful film. Afterlife in Japanese, it's called Wonderful Life. And oh gosh, gosh, what were some other films that I saw? Oh, yes, this is also the time um, I should say, also when I was. When I first turned 17, I remember the f I, I thought the best way to celebrate my 17th, and I, I was in the United States at the time, uh, would be to watch an NC-17 film. And so I watched two NC-17 films. The first one was Crash, the David Cronenberg-directed film Crash, which I find to be uh, very 
interesting, but I must admit I need to explore that film again. I've seen that film a number of times, but it's a little bit hard for me to get into that film. Uh, I don't hate it. I, I just don't love, love, love it as much as I do other films of David Cronenberg. But I really should revisit it and, and try to approach it again with a fresh mind. But anyway, that was one of the NC-17 films that I saw when I turned 17. The other one that I saw was the re-release of the film Pink Flamingos. And when I saw this film in the movie theater, this was, you have to remember, this was before uh, YouTube or anything like that. So I, I really had no idea what to expect. I didn't even real why I was thinking I was looking at this poster with Divine and, and, and you know, with the gun and, and I was thinking and the red dress, that beautiful red dress. And I was thinking to myself, why is this NC seventeen? Just based on the poster, it doesn't look that that horrible. And uh, so I was went into the theater and I had my popcorn and I was by myself and yeah, I, I guess it was a it was quite an eye-opening experience because i realized that the film yeah i think i realized that film can be anything you know what i mean it can be the just it can be so expressive and so down and dirty and yet so true and i think Pink Flamingos, in that respect, was a real, uh, just eye-opening experience. I didn't like it when I first saw the film, but I think I truly felt that I was watching something that was truly miraculous. I don't know if that makes any sense. I was quite disgusted, but I was thinking, you know, it's 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 so wonderful to be disgusted. <laughs> does that does that make any sense? I, I'm not sure if it makes any sense to me, but I, I just remember feeling so happy and so disgusted at the same time. And then ever since, I've just grown to love that film so much because it, I I just admire its its audacity and the way it it challenged me when I was 17. So thank you very much, John Waters. So you 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 gave me another formative moment in my cinema viewing upbringing so thank you yes so that is the state of my film yes my film background as it were it's not so exciting um, I suppose I can end this video with just a few sets of random bits of trivia I suppose film related, related trivia about me I don't have any connections to any famous people, but I remember, well, actually, I don't remember this uh, at all, but my mother, when she was alive, she told me this, but when we were living in, in Connecticut when I was very young, uh, apparently, um, Chloe Seveny babysat me when I was a little kid, and this was because I was, we were living in the same town that Chloe Seveny and her family was living in. And I actually re recall, I don't recall the moments necessarily, but I recall the fact that her mother, Mrs. Seveny, was a, a teacher of mine, uh, maybe when I was very little. So maybe it must have been like a pre-kindergarten or maybe another nursery school type of situation perhaps. But yes, yeah, so Mrs. Seveny was a teacher of mine. And I just have a general recollection of her in my mind as being a warm, kind woman, such a lovely woman. And uh, I don't remember ever meeting Chloe Seveny in person directly. I'm sure I must have, but I just don't have that memory. But of course, this was still before she was still a, a kid herself. So this was before she became this famous actress, this wonderful actress. So... Um, Ah, yes, so Mrs. Seveny and Chloe Seveny. So I have this connection, I suppose, with, with fame in that respect. Although I'm sure they, they, they don't remember me at all. Uh, if Chloe Seveny remembers me, uh, hello. <laughs> but um, the, what else? What else is that? What else is there? Yes, and also, I, as I mentioned, we lived in the town that's next to the town of New Canaan, Connecticut, which is depicted in the film The Ice Storm. 
and also let's see oh yes I maybe I'll end with this story um, I was in college and it was a I must have been a freshman in college and I went to a pretty uh, it was, it's a pretty well-known college and I don't know how I got in because I'm not that smart of a person but oh actually that's a good point let me let me just mention this this is the power of film so in high school I had to study for my SATs because I went to a American school and I was trying to get into a US university and so in order to do that I had to study for my SATs and you know part of that study meant that you had to study a lot of these English vocabulary words in order to increase your vocabulary in order to answer that component of the SAT test. And I remember that the one question had a word and I still remember this is I this is why I love cinema because I love the film Hellraiser and I also love the film Hellbound Hellraiser 2. And which is a sequel to Hellraiser. Now, those of you who know Hellbound Hellraiser 2 will remember that there is a character whose name is Dr. Chenard, and he's a pretty, he's a pretty uh, a significant character in the mythos and the universe of Hellraiser for very specific reasons. And I won't go into those details, but Dr. Chenard is a very significant character. And I remember one of his lines. Um, he says, what does he say? Um, he says to another character whose name is Tiffany, he says, surgery is open, Tiffany. What was today's agenda? Ah, yes, evisceration. <laughs> and when I saw that, that for the first time as a kid, I had no idea what the word evisceration meant. And so I looked it up, and you know, we our family had a, a little dictionary, so we just I looked up the word evisceration, and I just said, "Oh, that's what evisceration means." Okay, that's really nice. And then I just closed it. And then just uh, some time later, some years later, when I was taking the SATs, this yeah, the word evisceration came up in one of the questions. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so I can probably thank my love of the film Hellbound Hellraiser Two for allowing me to be able to answer that question on the SATs with confidence and probably correctly. And that probably was uh, enough to take me just over the top enough to be considered for enrollment in this particular university. So I probably have to uh, thank my love of Hellraiser 2 uh, for getting me into the university that I was able to get into. So thank you Hellraiser 2 for teaching me the word evisceration. Um, so what was I saying? So yes, so after I got into college, I, uh, I was, you know, there, it was a very famous college. And uh, so there were a lot of um, very famous people that came uh, to the university because there were a lot of famous alumni. And he wasn't a, an alumnus, but I think he went to school there for a bit. So Oliver Stone... So Oliver Stone came to campus and he came to give a talk. I think he was giving a talk about Nixon and also about JFK, but also he was talking about his book, which had just been published. It was called A Child's Night Dream or something like that. Do you remember that? And it was a, prob it was a memoir of his time in Vietnam. And so it was just published. So I think he was there promoting his book. And he was in a particular point, some place in campus, I think it was called the Whitney Humanities Center in New Haven. And this is part of the campus. And so I went to that event where he was going to speak because I was a big fan of Oliver Stone, you know, JFK, uh, uh, yeah, Natural Born Killers, uh, Platoon, my goodness. You know, so this was a, a master in my eyes. And so I heard him talk, and he was talking about his time in Vietnam, and uh, also he was talking about it, particularly in the context of his making of the film Born on the Fourth of July. And then after the talk was over, which is about an hour, uh, he was selling books, so I bought a book, his book Child's Night Dream, and then I lined up, I lined up for, uh, for him to autograph the book, 
And so I was waiting in line, and there were many people waiting in line, obviously, and he was sitting at a little table and just signing books, giving autographs, and just thanking people. And so I was waiting in line, and the person uh, next uh, in front of me went up and uh, had his or her book signed and then said thank you and moved off, and it was my turn. So then I was just standing there, I remember, at the table, and Oliver Stone, the great Oliver Stone, was sitting right in front of me, just sitting there at the table. And uh, he said hello, and I said hello. And I just gave him the book because I just purchased the book, The Child's Night Dream. And so I gave him the book and he opened it up to the inside front cover. And he asked me, so to whom should I make this out? And I said, my name, you know, oh, my name is Daisuke Beppu. And then so he looked at me and then he nodded and he just looked back on the inside front cover of the book and he signed the book, Oliver Stone, whatever, to Daisuke or something, Oliver Stone. And he finished signing it, he closed the book, took the book, gave it to me, and then he looked me in the eye, and he said this, and I'll never forget this, and then Oliver Stone closed the book, he looked me in the eye, and he said this, well, Daisuke, maybe by the time you graduate from this university, you'll have learned enough English to be able to finish my book. So I absorbed what he said to me and I just nodded and I said thank you very much and I just walked away. And I walked out of the building and I remember feeling a little bit, I wasn't sad necessarily, but I was a little bit disappointed because uh, you know I, I looked up to him and he sort of said this to me. Obviously he looked at me and he just saw some, you know, chinky Asian guy and he thought that I had no ability to speak English even though I was enrolled <coughs> in this university which is called Yale University in New Haven and so he, he obviously had an assumption about me and uh, my apparent lack of ability to speak English so uh, I walked out of the building and I remember this very clearly I, I tore the book up and I just threw it in the trash and uh, I I hate Oliver Stone as a person I think he's quite despicable but I learned a very valuable lesson actually which is I'm able now to separate uh, the despicable nature of a, of a particular filmmaker and his or her work so for example I really now I love JFK I think that's such a marvelous film and even t now I I, I I think that's such a, it, you know, Oliver Stone is a genius for making that film JFK. Um, and I will never, ever think differently because it's just a, a fantastic film. Although there's one bit that I, I don't really, I well, no, I should, let me save that for another video when I talk about JFK. But uh, I, I find that film to be fascinating. It's, it's a marvelous work. One of the great films, uh, American films of the 90s. So I love that film even to this day, but I hate Oliver Stone as a person because I think he's a bit of a, an a-hole. But um, I, I really should thank Oliver Stone uh, as much as I uh, despise him. I think I should thank him for teaching me this valuable lesson. So if you're out there, thank you. <laughs> All right, so let me just end there and just want to say thank you very much. And hopefully I will see you again very soon. So, cheers.